Good evening. Uh, welcome to this launch event for new books being published by Bloodaxe this week by Salima Hill and Mark Baldron. Uh, the books are Salima Hill's Women in Comfortable Shoes, Hot on the Heels of Men Who Feed Pigeons, and Mark Waldron's Straight Up Giant. Mark Waldron's book is his fifth collection, and Salima's is her 21st book of poetry. Uh, Mark's with us live tonight, uh, reading from London. Um, and because Salima's not able to do online events of this kind, um, I went and filmed her in Dorset. And so we've got film of her reading from her book. Um, we're going to do it in our usual way of having first, um, it would be Mark reading live one set, and then we'll have Salima reading a chunk of her new book. Then we'll go back to Mark, and then we'll go back to Salima. And because we will only have Mark here talking about his book, we've invited two special guests. We've got Wayne Holloway-Smith, editor of Poetry Review, and the poet Julia Copas, who's done a published an interview with um, Salima Hill in Poetry London. And they're both fans of both Salima's work and Mark's. So it should be an interesting discussion that we have at the end. So I'd like to start off by introducing Mark um, to read from A Straight Up Giant. Mark. Hi. Um, so I'm going to do a few poems from the Straight Up Giant. The first, I'm going to do some from, um, there's a section in the book uh, called uh, Eleven Grim Poems, and they're kind of poems loosely inspired by, by fairy tales. So they kind of, they use the tropes of, of fairy tales. And um, yeah, I'm not really going to say much to introduce each poem. I probably won't. Uh, after in, after saying this at the beginning, I'm just going to do the poems. I've discovered, I've said this at many readings, that that um, what I think my poems are about is always much less interesting than what other people misconstrue them as being about. So I've learned to um, never say too much about a poem before I read it or um, recite it. So this first half is going to be a few poems from um the grim poem section the woodman prince in a kingdom lit by lashings of sunshine and due process there once lived a handsomely assembled woodman who would turn just like that into a nicely put together prince and then back into the woodman and then the prince and then the woodman and then the prince, and then the woodman, and then the prince. The changes occurred with an arbitrary frequency. Sometimes they burst rapid as the splutters of a guttering candle, and or a flickers of an ailing bulb. And other times he would seem to settle for a while into one or other of the states and would look around tentative increasing in confidence that he might have solidified once and for all around the axle of whatever that manifestation happened to be, only to suddenly judder for a moment with the sound of the grinding of gears before his appearance switched back to that of the rustic woodman with an unkempt beard or that of the suave and clean-shaven prince with a jewelled ballot knife tucked into his belt. Oh, but how the maidens were mad for him in each of his modes, and would kiss him in reiterant and headlong kisses, so that they and their friends might switch when he switched, might shriek when he switched mid-kiss. And then the young women would all jump up and down and clap their hands with happiness and fright. And the woodman or prince would laugh along with them every time the switcheroo came upon him in their presence. What stripe of misdeed must the old tailor have committed that a curse that dumb should have stitched his innocent son? So this next one is called the traumatized fox. 
Once time, a fox screams so thick he blows his pants clean off. Those pants tail on, land on the lake, splish, troubling the surface only somewhat. What the fox had witnessed. Deep in forest where men and laws get well and properly lost, a bad house had demolished its occupants. A man, a woman, and the special child they had named Ash. First it broke their bones in slamming doors. Then it pressed them hard and hard again betwixt its walls. Then it ran its mangled banisters across their meat. Then it sieved their juices through its rugs. And all the while the house bricks crunched against their mortar and windows flexed with a tremulous moan like the sound of an old fellow's pleasure at a young woman's touch. Oh, now a thin wind blows in as a nasty nighty night. The fox's pants still float on the lickety lake. Through its open door, the wicked house, it burps a greasy reek of carnivore. Bottomless fox shivers. What is right goes out like a, like a light. Blossom. Once there lived a brother and sister called Blossom and Blossom. Blossom was cruel and kind. In a forest, I say, they dwelt and were as poor as a humperdink moon dipped in nothing worth saying and then lost down the back of a cosmos. Blossom was smarter than a mouse in a homemade catskin jumpsuit, bow tie of cat liver whisker stitched. Blossom was quiet and loud and silly and smart. Both were a species afar from the lumbering tree who lugs his preposterous weight and who is witness to all the quick, quick, slow. Blossom and Blossom got bitten off face down by wolves running on foreign law. A witch awoke breaks brittle sticks quick for the oven. Something good leaks out of the world. Something bad leaks in. Okay. I've never um, memorized this one, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to read it. It's called Fungi, if I can find it. Fungi. Time a once upon, when mush spake fruity and bird blushed torrid neath feathery veneer, a tableau was. Jagged yet not unapproachable peaks partake of the different distance. The material atop disposed in the manner of a turreted castle. One or two clouds ensure the sky need not be entirely blue. A wishy daytime moon sucks up in her long coventry of orbit. Forest glade, bush, tiny flower platted. A comely king bobs a crawl across on a cock horse, lording it chivalric, saddled up bulls and all, heraldic nibnabs, somewhat uncomfy in armour. And the scampering girls and boys who have not as yet grown such pungent odours as trail from kings and queens and commoners in wispy banners advertising magic and the whole scenario, Rio, Rio, with its from here to there gets off scot-free, gawky shrooms and king and all, thick with hidden hair. Little men. 
What is an uptown man but a blurt, chinny chin chin, but a plea, chinny chin chin? Tenderized by this rickety piece he's living in. This piece that hangs as poison fruit in the tree, tree, trees. Three little men, dot, 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 I'll blow your top in. I'll rasher you streaky, I'll bite your little house right off with my two attention teeth, rows of soldiers hid for now behind the plump hedges of their come-hithers. What type of king is making the roof go in, little men? What kind of king, chinny chin chin, let me in? Gone off. Morrow, lemony pot. An orchard. No bod there except an under the table medievalist, be loitering in party coloured coat hardy, and his wimpled mistress. Reenactment passed just like ours. Canters left to right, a manticore, chic as nougat. Is that you, befrolicking off in the betown bisquare, snood, early knickers, smile like cheesecake, like a bottom bad? Rudimentary plosives, pip, 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 bang. Apple everywhere, everything, everywhere. Okay, this is the last, um, the last poem in, in this set, so, and the last one of these um, grim poems. The Princess and the Pea. In the castle's royal chambers, dim lanterns cast stiff shadows of full armoured guards across the granite floors. Flit their breastplates ring and tickle their furious butch faces hid neath visored hounds. In an alcove, a tapestry rhubarbs. On a rug, a wolfhound breaks perspicacious wind. Now look, perchance, at what lies under, fiddling the pastries, knocking the books, spinning the pulse. Because whatever it is down there, it's mine. Thank you. See you later on. Thank you, Mark. Um, and now before we hear from Salima, um, what we have from Salima is a video and the audio is, is a little lower than the live audio level. So just uh, to say to you, the people who are watching, if you'd like to turn up your audio on your laptops now, uh, that would probably help. Um, I filmed Salima reading Eight of the, from eight of the sequences in uh, Women in Comfortable Shoes. Uh, her last book was poems, very short poems relating to men, and the new book is very short poems relating to women. Um, we've got tonight um, a set of four, from, four sequences, first of all, and then after Mark has read again, we'll have a selection from another four sequences. And the reading was in a mar rather marvellous location in an octagonal tower. So there's a, there's a lot of eight going on here tonight. Um, Salim has also got reservations about readings. And one of the things she says is that she writes a lot in the first person, but while the poems draw on her life, they're not necessarily directly autobiographical. Uh, she has poems about her father, supposedly, which actually are conflations of of her own father and other fathers. And so the mother in her poems is a conflation of her mother and other mothers. So she doesn't like things to be as exact as it would seem to be if you're actually seeing her in, in a reading, actually um, reading the poems and you think the my in the poem, the I in the poem is her and the he and the she are her mother, mother and father, not necessarily the case. She blurs those boundaries. So for the first part of tonight, she's going to read from the sequences Fish Face, My Friend Weasel, Susan and Me, and Dolly. And she's going to start by reading now from Fish Face. And the first poem in that is 
my mother with a pair of scissors. I'll start by reading from my new collection, Women in Comfortable Shoes. The first one is from The Secrets Fish Face. My mother with a pair of scissors. Why is my mother never seen at school? Or even in the neighbour's house next door, is she fast asleep in her eye mask? Or does she creep around the house with scissors looking for a wing to be clipped? Does she cower drenched in eucalyptus oil, in bedding primed with orange peel and marmite, listening for the whine of the mosquitoes who track her day and night, who won't let go, who aren't so much devoted as deranged? Whatever is she doing all the time alone? in our enormous house next door. Is she frightened? I have no idea. Maybe she just sleeps all day, like pears of the mosquitoes who track her. My mother on the verge of tears. My mother on the verge of tears, as usual, walks about her house with a tea towel twisted round her head like a turban, part of her war against mosquitoes. Can't they understand that she is exhausted? and hasn't got the energy to scratch. Can't they go and talk to someone younger? Or better still, go and eat grass? Actually, she doesn't call it tea towel. She calls it drying up cloth, which is longer and doesn't sound so cosy. But she's like that. She doesn't like things to be cosy. This one's also from the same sequence about my mother, and it's called Fish Face. I thought I liked the cat, but I don't. And he, the cat, doesn't like me. He doesn't like anything but fish, and sicking up fish in the basket. The patient dog tries in vain to sleep in. All she wants to do is sleep and sleep. In that way, the dog's like my mother. She would sleep forever if she could, to get away from thinking about me. Me and my big smile, she can't stand it, follows her around as she paces from room to room, armed with citronella. Next one is from the sequence called My Friend Weasel. It's called the Shimmering Plains of Africa. We creep along the hedge with our swimming fins and stale doughnuts stolen from the bins. And when at last we reach the secret lake, Matron can be seen neatly parking her sunbeam torbet by the willow trees. She holds the door open like a chauffeur. We pile in. The seats are real leather. Matron in her gory skirt and cardigan, who combs our hair, who calls us her giraffes, whose hair is like the shimmering plains of Africa, who gets us out of bed to see the moon, who lets us smear Nutella on our bacon and gives the homesick lemon meringue pie, is capable of nothing except something we later understand to be love. The next one is called Sherbet Lemons. I've written a lot of poems called Sherbet Lemons because they were the best thing about my childhood. Sherbet Lemons. Perched up in the tree we're not allowed in, we sack our Sherbet Lemons while our fathers strut around the desks of distant offices encased in suits like men encased in icicles. Our disinfected mothers, meanwhile, squeezed inside their corsets, slips and braziers, take up their positions in their kitchens, while doing all they can not to think they might become, already are, unnecessary. Marriage. The 
fact our mothers married our fathers is something we don't even want to think about. It's easy to think they're rubber parents of rubber children in a rubber world. Everybody trusts them. They're so charming. We, however, only trust ourselves. We sit in rows like wolves in the cedar tree and wait together for our hearts to break. This one's called Mouse, which is the name of my Irish wolfhound, which is a bit distracting for me, but it's nothing to do with the poem. It's midnight in the dormitory. Our lips are softer than the softest lipless moths, as in our dreams they settle on the horses that nuzzle our elasticated boots. My friend's awake. She wants to disappear. Her body wants to disappear too. She doesn't eat. She doesn't menstruate. Her breath is like the whisker of a mouse. And lastly, the house from that same sequence my friend reads on. Because he likes to hear the pigeons coo. My father's room is right at the top. My mother's room is here, next to mine. Apparently I'm going off the rails. I dress in stolen flowers and stolen necklaces and thus arrayed am going off the rails. Children's home, detention centre, Borstal. They threaten me with everything they can. Idiots. They're wasting their time. I never listen to a word they say. The only thing I listen to is the planet's elliptical, unsyncopated whoosh. The next sequence is called Susan and Me. And I read a poem called A Man with a Palm. I hope I'm not hurting anybody, but I don't think so. A man with a palm. We lived without caresses. Unlike me, she would and did submit to anything. She studied ancient Greek. She gave up butter, let herself be bullied and enslaved, and every day she grew. She grew so tall. She wasn't like a person anymore, and talking to her was a waste of time. As for me, I'd had this revelation that matrons and their discipline meant nothing, absolutely nothing, and my time, day and night, was now taken up with concentrating on my disobedience. I nursed it like a man with a palm. I worshipped it, I was in love with it. The blood stained mower. Withdrawings of our ponies, of our underwear, of those we took delight in being mean about and those we fell in love with. Like the gardener, whose dusty, blood stained boiling suit we marvelled at, and at the boots, and at the blood stained mower we lay and sunbathed naked to the sandal. Okay, I may be wrong about the bloodstains. We wrote our journals till our hands were raw. Her green and white striped dress. Her green and white striped dress, the same as mine. The sort of dress you'd wear to ride a goat or murder someone on a dark night was not entirely clean and much too tight. But unlike me, she didn't take it off.
to mark the hottest day of the year by lying naked in the long grass waiting for the man who rode the mower. Pig. I used to take her swimming to the gravel pits. Or rather I would swim and she would wallow. Half submerged like a long pig that doesn't even grunt or dream of grunting. I think I got so many poems about grunting. Oh. This one is called Curd. When I see her in her threadbare dressing gown, somebody has wrapped her in like curd. The gentle face that wishes it was air, now pressed against the wall. I lose my nerve and walk away in tears, having witnessed something I am not prepared to bear. Tinned fish. They ring me up to tell me she's been found sitting in a tunnel eating fish. Doesn't seem to make any sense. They say it one last time she is violent. That's all from that one. The next sequence is called Dolly. Miss DeVos, head mistress. She used to give me milk and stale biscuits. I hated milk. I hated stale biscuits. And such a heavy chain round her neck as if she were a ship or a bull. My friend Annie. More pigs! <laughs> Meeting Annie for the first time felt like feeling what a pig might feel, shuffling down an alley late one night, alone and lost and looking for a home. A ginger pig, now twitching in the moonlight, who's dreaming of a snout full of root, whose skin is cracked, whose hairs are dry and bristly, whose tiny eyes are hidden under ears like newborn babies hidden in their prams, whose belly is a meeting place for worms, whose knees, if you can call them knees, are wrinkly, whose purity of heart is like a lettuce, who doesn't even speak its own language. After all, this honkless, Gruntless pig has never met another pig before and meeting one for the last time. Sorry, meeting one for the first time, hey. It was such a long way from the first line that I got confused. Do you want to it's read it? It's very complicating because it do you want is. To, do you want to read it again? Okay. And there is water behind you if you need water behind you. I'm all right, thank you. All right. I can't look at your good. face, Neil. Well, can I look at the camera instead? Yeah, you look at the camera. me by saying, don't look at the camera, or look at you. No, no, no look at the camera. The camera is, 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 okay. is anyone who's watching it. Someone said, look at, the, look at the light at the back of the hall, didn't they? But that's a bit different, sort of look far away. So not at the red light. Okay, I'll just go along with my friend Annie again, I'm yeah. sorry. The thing is, it needs to be shown because grammatically, it's like a marathon because the first line goes with the last line, if you see what I mean. But anyway, it doesn't really make sense unless you can see it on the page. Meeting Annie, my friend Annie, my friend Annie. Meeting Annie for the first time felt like feeling what a pig might feel. Shuffling down an alley late one night, alone and lost and looking for a home. A ginger pig now twitching in the moonlight, who's dreaming of a snout full of root whose skin is cracked, whose hairs are dry and bristly, whose tiny eyes are hidden under ears, 
like newborn babies hidden in their prams, whose belly is a meeting place for worms, whose knees, if you can call them knees, are wrinkly, whose purity of heart is like a lettuce, who doesn't even speak its own language. After all, this honkless, gruntless pig has never met another pig before. Felt like meeting what a pig might feel and meeting one for the first time. I think that makes a bit more sense. Um, Dr. Davy. Dr. Davy. After lying quietly on her table for what seemed hours in my underwear, I felt her hands between my legs like hunters, intoxicated hunters hunting marmots who go insane with longing if the marmots, like God himself, won't make their presence known. And finally, Linda. Never underestimate the sick. That's what Dr. D always says. And never underestimate a duck. The duck of my late uncle, for example, who lived a life of leisure in his bathroom, simply by her having once been cute. Well, that was Salima reading from Women in Comfortable Shoes from four of the uh, sequences in the book. Uh, apologies if that came over slightly out of sync. Uh, that seems to be something that was going on with the live stream, so apologies for that. But at the end, I'll give you links to actually re-watch the video if you want to, where you can see it fully in sync and louder. Um, but for now, we're going to move on to Mark Waldron reading a second set from A Straight Up Giant. Mark. Thanks, Neil, and thanks for organising this event. Um, okay. Uh, a few more poems from the book. Contingency. If you dig a hole and get in it, what then? If you say, flick a tree and holler, well, then what? If you reverse into an attitude of dotty surrender, all flags flying, the sky as blue as an unblown whistle, the children dancing, well, what's next for pity's sake? If you ride a horse sideways, the crisp mist coming down all over, the broom, broom, the char, char, do you like horses, what they say? If you come screaming over the hillocks, the dust and the dust, a plume in your bonnet, a char, char, the sheer amounts of a horse, you know what side your bread's buttered. Both sides. This next one's called Puppetry. Now I've seen everything. Toe rags have taken the citadel. Shampoo patricians with hidden frills therein. The blappity gardens dug up piecemeal, tot by tot. The town dismantled brick by block, dead to buried into holes, pinky porcelain, crocodile treasure, naked throwaways, all sorts. Shall we take a walk in the old town, you and I? Shall we pause by the fountains with the knocked off concrete monsters? The water, the cracking water wetted, trees believed. My lady honed to a pin, pin, pin. Our hands, excited by their quota of ghost, play under our supervision. The good old attendant day 
saucisson, the mise-en-scene, the laws of physics, luncheon, peripheral happenstance, my m -m 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 mouth your b -b 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 mouth So um, all my books have had a character in them called Marcy. And uh, I don't think she's spoken before in any of the other books, but um, she speaks in this one. And there are a number, there's a little section of poems that are, that are uh, voiced by Marcy. So this is one of those. Marcy says, mine and Graham's private parts, they have more in common with each other than they do with us. They'd be so happy together, down in the woods, throwing pine cones, sniffing the wild flowers, hiding behind the big trees, jumping out and laughing, playing tag, scenting the summer air with cute effervescence. Then out in the big field that leans down towards the brook, they picnic on cucumber sandwiches washed down with ginger beer. I can see them now as they lie back and watch the drifting clouds without a thought in their minds because they have no minds to speak of. Hand in hand, down by the lake they'd walk, wordlessly, smoking French cigarettes or sucking the boiled sweets they sometimes share and stiffening a little in the warm breeze. There's nothing but grit and sunshine and that delicious hopelessness that makes a privy pea to smile. Henry. Look at my mouth and how she intones the sky and how she's dirted my corpse is dirting yours now and your topsy face. I pulled my lardy da down by its turby string and then in the throne room I huggled it headlong, splashed it all over toe to top. Speak my pie holes dolly box then button up. Here, have a word, bite, no way have to bite me. So um, I think I'm going to change what I'm doing slightly. Um, Hippopotami at the Water Hotel. There were four secret turtle teeth hidden inside the water hotel bedside table drawer. My hush-hush aide-de-camp, hippopotamus disguise, crab-like sideways gait, had sploshed through our room and snuck them in there while we were downstairs, snorkeling for Vietnamese seaweed and chatterbox whelks. Her purpose in so doing was, and still is, something of a tough nut to crack. I loved her to pieces, despite the fact she was unpredictable, classified and possibly a little unglued. It's funny how you can fervently want someone, even when they're completely clandestine and about as clear as dishwater. Perhaps it's just the other scent we love. The rest, the look of them, the way they move, their cleverness and kindliness being only bottling. Her tough skin surface brought to mind a scuffed old suitcase, which had been lugged up and down, rattling gangplanks as it toured the Persian Gulf in the 1920s, in the possession of a Belgian lady of a certain age, thin as a rake, specks, upset stomach, flat shoes. I never saw my aid out of her possumous cosy, or come to that, myself out of mine. Burn down. The trees rise up, 
burn down, the trees rise up and burn down. Dear reader, I don't, I'm going to have to start this one again. Let me just find it actually. Burn down, the trees rise up, burn down, the trees rise up and burn down. Dear reader, I don't even know, and I'm me. Spat of joy, the earth's grim dimple. Reader, I'm ashamed of everything. Feel free to leave. That's right. Pick up your clutch bag face, just go. No way. Don't go. We're having fun, aren't we? The trees rise up, burn down. The trees rise up and burn down. Spat of joy, the earth's grim dimple. Fee, five, foe, and no fun. The trap of the world is spun. And this is a tiny poem I'm going to end with. Um, yeah, I didn't know what this poem was about when I wrote it. and. Um, but then I realised some time later that I wrote it just after, very soon after my mother had died. And I think the bacon in the poem might be my mother and the, and the egg in the poem might be me. And the poem's called Bacon and Egg. What is bacon for, if not for feeling sorry for? Poor bacon lost her pig. What is egg for? Same. Sorry, egg lost his hen. What more is that to say? Only this. Nothing. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Mark. And we're now going to hear from Salima again. Um, we've changed a couple of the settings for, for the next video. Uh, so that may make a difference to the uh, the, the audio, uh, which we hope will be in more sync with the video. Um, this is going to be another four, another uh, a selection from another four of the sequences in the book. Uh, My mother with a beetle in her hair, fridge, the chauffeur, and dressed and sobbing. And so Salim is going to start with the poem Owls from My Mother with a Beetle in Her Hair. I'll read from a sequence called My Mother with a Beetle in Her Hair, I think, and it's called Owls. Because I had to do my homework first, and even then she only let me swim for 20 minutes at the very most, I'd wait until my mother was asleep and tipped her to the lake on my own, barely breathing in the cold and dark, when nothing could be heard but the owls with no idea how lucky they are. My mother wearing more than one coat. I'm white and wrinkly, but I won't stop swimming, in spite of what my little mother told me. Although to call her little is not polite, but I was like that then, so impolite, so inconsiderate and unpredictable and she was small and didn't like the water and felt the cold even on dry land even in her rugs in several coats she wanted to go home but I ignored her her one desire as I fought my way through the duckweed that spread across the surface of a lake the size and shape of something like a concert hall full of chairs and pianos made of water and disappeared between the slimy legs of sofas made of roots and mud cushions inhabited by ancient looking trout. My mother would be waving from the bank, her one desire to see me wrapped up warmly
Uh, my mother and the sheep. The sheep is for Neil. Once I came downstairs to find a sheep standing in the kitchen and my mother offering the sheep a ginger biscuit. I'm looking overjoyed to have a sheep suddenly arrive in her kitchen. It used to reappear, I remember, and fall asleep in my mother's lap and keep her nice and warm while I was swimming. That was when you lived on the farm, wasn't it? I suppose, because otherwise where would the sheep have come from? Maybe it come from my imagination. I will read now from the fridge. Tiny children. From time to time he will shudder. Like a fridge, where tiny children, rigid in their sacks, are being stacked while crying out for service. Whoops, oh god, my poor mother. Okay, other people's mothers. Other people's mothers are so kind. They give me biscuits, sometimes even sweets, wrapped in squeaky paper, chinking tea sets. But if I hear their husbands coming in, I run back home as fast as I can, home to where my mother curls upstairs as if she's been forbidden to come down, as if she isn't worthy of normality, as if she has denied herself a life. Alas, my mother is a devil seed. A devil see is something like a murderess. But murder I can understand, like jugs. Standing in the presence of my father. Standing in the presence of my father, I feel as uneasy as a child standing in a field full of fridges with all the doors torn off, and I can see bodies, all exactly the same, lying on their sides with perfect ponytails. And the Not fridges, sorry, the goose. I've never wished the dead were still here, that anyone who's died would come back. Anyone except the goose, perhaps. The big white goose who waddled like a fridge. A fridge with wary eyes on orange legs. But he was warm and nothing like a fridge. Imagine trying to cuddle a fridge. Imagine first cuddling and then roasting a fridge that you have loved. I don't think so. So no, I've never sold my little hut out for anyone who's died, except the goose, whose homeless down still floats across the valley as if to say, you'll look but never find me. Uh, I'll read from the chauffeur. Have you ever noticed what kind of eyes a chauffeur? <laughs> the chauffeur has, that's a good one, I have to do that. This one is called Hippo. Have you ever noticed what kind of eyes a hippo has? Her, eye, her eyes are like that. That's not to say her face is like a hippo's, because it's not. Just the kind of eyes. The kind yet rather miserable eyes. My sisters 
nipples. These are about my sister, not my mother now. My sister's nipples. Is it true one of them is hairy? And even if it is, what's wrong with that? She says, these little biscuits are delicious. No, they're not. They taste of dried pain. Tinkle, tinkle. Humility is all very well, but somebody is taking it too far. She's like a distant valley lost in mist, a dream of tinkling goats without the goats. Did you know that girls used to call going for a tinkle, going for a wee, going for a tinkle? <laughs> Tea time. This is so true, this is true. She brings us tea, with tea from a teapot, and chocolate biscuits from the biscuit tin. And after tea, she goes upstairs to scream. To scream? George. I didn't want to read George. Okay, we can tell. Too much. Lips. When they were alive, it was confusing, but now they're dead, it is not confusing. Or no more so than lips of different colours and different thicknesses are confusing. Gladioli. And all the time, she seemed to be saying, stop being happy. So I stopped. And everything went pear-shaped. And now, I'm like a gladionus or a mouse enjoying being singular again. Arrgh! Sorry. There's only one more from this, dressed and sobbing from the new book. I'm not very good at smiling, but I was meaning to smile. Okay, this one's called Dressed and Sobbing. No, it's not. It's from a sequence called Dressed and Sobbing. And it's called Women in Blankets. I like words with K in them, actually. Women in Blankets. People... Younger people called their loved ones. People who are sometimes, if not always, easier to love if they're dead or young again, one or the other, who mutter, who disown their arms and legs. People wrapped in grey, green, greasy blankets. These are now my people. Now I'm older. The mother of a daughter, sorry, the daughter of a mother or say the mother of a daughter, but the daughter of a mother, it's too late to say I'm sorry to for being me, to say I'm sorry for exhausting her. After I was born, he said, she changed. After that, she never smiled again. Oh, this one's called Athletic, Chaste, Untroubled. Yes, more Sherbet Nevins coming up. Athletic, Chaste, Untroubled. Athletic, Chaste, Untroubled. Sorry, I like those three words. Athletic, Chaste, Untroubled. Far from home, I share my Sherbet Nevins with the friend who, 60 years later, will be strapped like someone's luggage to a wheelchair and wheeled to a little patch of sun by one of two tired but clean nurses to smoke her tiny roly in peace. This 
This one's called Violet. I didn't choose which poems to read. And they're all about death and sad mothers. Sorry. When someone dies, the more there is a problem, the longer you will mourn them, apparently. So maybe that explains why I still mourn her. Though I prefer to think about it, to mourn. I never know what mourning someone means. I think about her even more now, now that I'm old myself, like she was. And in my lifetime, she was always old, just as I was young and always would be. My mother shrinking daily like a violet, crystallised until it can't breathe. Another reason could be, I suppose, although I find it painful to admit it, because now I'm so weak, I need a mother. And the last one from Dresden Sobbing is called Dresden Sobbing. Please, can someone give me a lake that I can go and jump in, dressed and sobbing? How can someone jump into a lake without a lake? So please, can someone give me one, a lake suitable for someone who loves jumping? My granddaughter's just been to Copenhagen and she jumped from five meters. Yeah, I didn't know how five meters was, but I've now worked it out and it's very tall. So I think of her if I can't do something. She waited for half an hour on the top diving board and then she made it. So we're now going to move into um, a discussion room and we will be joined by um, Julia Copas, Wayne Holloway-Smith and Mark Waldron um, to talk about Salima's book and Mark's book. Um, just waiting for Wayne. Um, before we, we start that, um, I'd just like to say that apologies that the first part of Salima's video was a bit out of sync. But if you go to the Blood Axe website and click on Salima's book, you can actually see the whole video there. Um, you can also see a second film that I shot of her reading from uh, earlier books. In fact, eight of, the, of eight of the collections that she published after Gloria. Um, again, eight, eight uh, sequences read in the octagonal garden tower. Uh, and they're both well worth watching. And also you see a lot of, of the connections between her books when you actually see her reading um, that particular selection, um, which I must confess I orchestrated specifically to show those connections. Um, so we'll, we'll start off, um, Mark, um, I remember you telling me that when Roddy Lumsden, the late Roddy Lumsden was editing your early books, uh, you were, he were talking about what other poets you were like, and he said the poet you were most like was Selima Hill. Um, did you, were you aware of that at the time? Was that something um, that, that you connected with? Not really, no. <laughs> he just said that out of the blue. I think what he said was that the only person I could think you might be compared with is her. Um, well, this, uh, this evening uh, you, both, you both read poems about hippos, for example. Maybe that's it. <laughs> but I haven't got a lemon sherbet poem yet. Mm, there's a lot of sherbet lemons in her work. Sherbet lemon, not lemon sherbet, yeah. Maybe you should say lemon sherbet, Mark, and that could be... Yeah, right. well, I need to do something with it, something yes. to do with it. Mm. Do you remember, Mark, you said once that um, you, when you first read John Berryman, you, you read his 77 Dream Songs, and then you thought to yourself, what, how is this guy ripping me off? Well, no, that, yeah, that's actually, um, that was a, that was uh, Doug Powell said that that he is said it about him. O'Hara, didn't he? That he said the first time he read Frank O'Hara, he thought, "How come this this guy's been ripping me off?" Except that he died ten years before I was born, or something. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean that happens, doesn't it? Sometimes you come across people who who <laughs> you realise have been ploughing the same furrow like a long time before you even <laughs> thought about doing that. But yeah, I don't know. What, I mean, when I look at Salima's work, I don't particularly 
But it's certainly not a common interest because she looks at her own life or versions of it and looks back, which is something I don't do. But I think I think so. I'm sure he didn't mean. Obviously, he didn't mean that. But uh, so yeah, I just I wondered whether he meant <laughs> use of imagery or something. Or I'm not sure. I, I I think one of the similarities between your work and I agree they're not they're not like they're not hugely similar. But you did say something, Mark, about your last poem, the bacon and egg poem at the end. Um, you you said about that, that you often don't know or you weren't aware in that case. And I think you've said in other cases what a poem is about um, when you're writing it and, and then often not always after you've written it. So it that chimed with something I've heard um, Salima say um, that her, her well she talked about a connection between for instance poodles and bluebells and that that meant something particular to her so it's almost that dreamlike thing again um that that meant they she said they go together like two notes in music but she didn't expect them to do that for for other people um but there's this thing about sort of um truth and meaning um uh, that uh yeah i just i think i think there's a, a a similarity that you both trust your poems both of you trust your poems uh to say something to you without you forcing them to say that thing i mean you don't set out with a road map and sort of i mean it's very clear that neither of you does that you don't set out and think right a is going to lead to B, and it's going to mean C, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, well, in this book, I mean, the second half of the things I was reading were some of them were just on the edge of nonsense because I, I kind of, <laughs> I think um, it's actually impossible really to write nonsense unless you're um, a machine because you know that that's what you're saying really that that. Um, that it's always driven by the unconscious sort of thing. Yeah, and that other people are going to make something of it, whatever you make of exactly, it. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. And also, yeah, it's funny that thing of um, whether, whether it's okay for people to, you know, I often hear people going, oh, yes, I write my poem and then it's out in the world and people can do what they want with it and make it mean whatever they want. I don't know whether, uh, how much... Sometimes I can buy into that. I mean, someone like Salima, I would have thought that's not re really the case, is it? It's kind no, of... No, I, I agree, yeah. No, in, in Salima's case, when she writes it, she never wants to read it again, which is partly why she doesn't like reading. Uh, she doesn't even keep copies of her books. Uh, right. She's completely otherworldly. I mean, she's totally without any modern technology. She still writes everything by hand, doesn't even use a typewriter, let alone a laptop. Uh, so she is very, as it were, separated from the, the outside world in that kind of way. Yeah, her, but her output is amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't, I can't, I don't know if anyone else can. I can't think of anyone else who sort of matches her in terms of of output. Um, and that could be a bad thing if the if they were bad poems. <laughs> it could be a very bad thing. Um, yeah, just um, I was shut up in a minute, but I did. I want to say about this um, dream that she told me about because I was always, I've always been envious. I'm quite a slow writer myself, and I've always been envious of that. You know, she's so prolific, and uh, she told me about this dream where this uh, she's at a party or a reading, and this sort of soft pink worm sort of crawls up onto her tongue, and before she can close her mouth, it. It, it comes out and starts slithering out like uh, spaghetti and she just can't stop that happening. And, you know, it just goes on and on until she's in the end, she's turned inside out and um, she, she, you know, it, it's horrific. I mean, she's scared that she's going to die. So she was telling me that it was actually quite an unpleasant uh, thing. So, yeah, it reminds me slightly of the, um, you know, the Sylvia Plath, line um the blood jet is poetry there's no stopping it and um 
yeah, I, I wonder how envious I am now of that. <laughs> Sounds pretty frightening. Wayne, as, as an outside reader and a close reader of both, you must have noticed the changes in their work. I mean, Mark's new book is very different from his previous books. And over the past few years, mm -hmm. Lena's work has really changed to be just sequences of very, very short poems. Mm. Yeah, well, I sort of came to that. So I, I've, um, I reckon I'm like quite well versed, so to speak, in Mark's work. I've been reading it since forever. And in fact, like he was one of those people like, um, so I was in Roddy Lumsden's like beginners group where Mark was in like the advanced group. And he sort of occasionally would, would mention Mark's work then. And eventually we ended up kind of, uh, I don't know, hanging out a bit and and I, I his, his is one of the first pieces of work I think or style that I thought oh shit you're actually allowed to do that like it doesn't have like and it kind of gave me permission really to sort of to try things out and to to lean into like particular interests that that I had or preoccupations and ways of expressing that, that I didn't really know you were sort of allowed to do when I was first starting. I think with Mark, like he's always been, sorry, Mark, it feels like it's weird to sort of say he when you're <laughs> here, but um, Mark, Mark's work for me has always been um, a means through which to kind of develop his own vocabulary, really. Like the, it expresses, it gets to a certain aspect of like a tiny bit of the universe um, that you wouldn't normally get to without that, that level of playfulness, the way that it kind of smudges reality or something. And when it does that, it kind of... Um, what I love about it, actually, is that we we hardly ever get like a specific like. There's no resolve a lot of the time, but the question that the poem leaves you with kind of makes the world seem a little bit weirder, or it leaves me with like an emotional experience more than anything that I could put specifically sort of like. You, maybe Mark's poems are never going to be stuck on the GCSE syllabus because I wonder whether there's a specific answer to. To, to a question that is posing or something, you know what I mean? I think I was going to ask Mark, like, I've heard you speak before about um, Ashbury, and you were saying, like, like um, when someone asked, sorry, Neil, this does relate to your question. Um, someone asked Ashbury, uh, how do you think your work is changing as you, as you kind of grow and get older? And, and I've heard Mark sort of quote it and say, well, I just think that they're getting sillier. And I was wondering, like, about about that in your own work, Mark? Because I don't necessarily see, there are bits actually that do seem sort of sillier or more gratuitously playful than some of your early work. But like, but do, how do you see, how do you see that kind of development? Do you think there's been more of a turn towards like a silliness or something? Well, maybe, yeah, maybe a bit of a temporary one. Maybe, um, uh, maybe through reading a lot of Ashbury. Yeah, some journalists, said how do you see your work as having progressed over the last couple of years and you thought for a bit and then said it just keeps getting sillier and sillier and that's something which is sort of true of his work isn't it and um the fun that that kind of the sense that he gets from nonsense I suppose I wanted to experiment a bit with that but I don't think I would stay there as a as a kind of place to live in writing but there's also darker elements in your work now, Mark, don't you think? It, there's silliness and darkness at the same time. Well, maybe. Uh, um, that's that thing where, when you start doing a lot of readings, you start to, uh, I'm sure other people have said this, you start to want a reaction from the audience and then you start writing funnier poems to try because the only feedback you get really is laughter or people walking out, I suppose. But... <laughs> and I think um, you can find yourself going down that road and then suddenly being billed as a kind of comedy poet, which I didn't want to be. So I'm trying to slightly reverse away from that now. Um, but I'll probably go back again. It's silly to try and guide your what you do, isn't it? You, you always finish up abandoning those plans, whatever they might be. Yeah, as well as Roddy Lumsden, another key figure for you was Michael Donaghy, wasn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, he was the first person. The, the reason I recite rather than reading, although I did some reading tonight, but if I'm 
if I'm on a stage, I would never read. And that's because that's Michael didn't. And um, I just thought, oh, if he can do it, I, I'll do it. Because he was the first, that was, his workshop was the first workshop. But he he died quite soon after I started, so, but yeah. But I thought um, Salima's short, the short poem thing worked incredibly well. To the point where I almost forgot I was reading poetry at, that um, it began to work on me in a way that poems don't normally. I can't really describe it, but it seemed to take do something quite new with it as a as a sort of art form. And the, 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 uh, the, 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 the kind of cumulatively, life. don't they? Yeah, they do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I I wanted to ask a couple of things that um, Wayne has said have really chimed me about your work, Mark, um, about the way that they, they linger in the mind. I'm thinking I can't. Um, is it a swapping clove? I can't remember the title of the poem. I can look. There is swapping clothes with a friend. As well. Yeah, that that sort of poem is it. You know, it kind of unfolds in the mind after you've after you've read it. You go away and you you know it's sort of. Uh, nagging away at you uh not in an unpleasant way um but um and the, yeah the last time just to get it here it's okay to be afraid um and another thing i really love about your work is um the this I, I, it's going to sound strange the the kind of beingness of objects i think wayne put it a bit better than that but um Another a poem of yours that's not in this book, the the stick that oh, um yeah. yeah, and and in this poem, um you've got a poem called The Bitten Ball. And uh I just it just seems so true. This you say deep was the well. So the so the ball gets sort of blown down into a well, and you said uh you say deep was the well and lost was the ball. How blankly gone objects linger, how they look up as if to say, what of it? And then it goes on, what after what? But I mean, that's just, yeah, that's very, very, that's very true. Um, but what was I actually going to say? Um, I will, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested that you are a copywriter. I, I started off like, I was a copywriter many, many moons ago as well. And I, so I wanted to know if that um, affects or how that feeds into your writing, if at all. But I, I just wanted to make the observation that you and Salima are um, very good at um, a sort of word-to-word -word close up uh, level. Um, so again, I'm trying to remember poems. I know there's a poem called Edith that um, Salima didn't read tonight. Um, and I can't remember the poem of yours where someone is hugging a present, they're hugging a present to their chest that they haven't opened. And can you tell me what what's the title of that poem? Because, I don't think I think it's one of the uh italicized asides. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, it is. It's the because you've got these prose bits running through, haven't you, which I really like. Um uh, sort of would you call them prose poems in, in between? Yeah. Um, and it's I then, okay. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. So it begins. It's on page twenty six, and it begins. Uh, perhaps I, I hoped to take in return for that modest res receptacle. Blah blah blah. Sorry. Blah blah. blah. <laughs> it's very good. It's much better worded than that. And then the last sentence is so like a child you seem standing there. And yet also so not. And I, I love that. And yet also so not. It's just like a, an everyday phrase um, and reminded me of that. Um, I, so, I mean, Salima does that a lot, I think. Um, so it, her poem Edith begins, as everybody knows, she knows nothing, but everybody's, but everybody's wrong. She knows a lot. And I, and I love that kind of uh, sort of playful manipulation of everyday phrases. Um, I don't yeah, know. If that's that... very true. Yeah. Of her that she does. Um, and in a way, it's quite copywriter-like um, in some yeah. ways that she 
There's a great bit where I think my, one of my absolute favourite bits in the book, if I can find, I made a note of it somewhere. There's a bit about um about buying a lake. Yeah. And a swimsuit. I can't find it now. Yeah, it's towards the end, isn't it? Something like, yeah. It's about yeah. Um, b- being divorced and going out and and wanting to buy a lake and a swimsuit. And it was the order of um, the order that those things are put in is like really comical because, um, yeah, I can't find it now. Can I say something real quick about Salima? Because Neil, I am aware that you did ask me about Salima as well. Mm. And I just, I didn't really talk about the kind of conversation moved on a little bit. But I actually came to Salima's work with Jutlands to start with. I mean, I hadn't started writing much before that came out. So that was like my first experience. So I'd almost always seen her as like a short, uh, as like a, a writer of shorter poems. And then kind of when I delved into the back catalogue a little bit, that's when I started learning that she'd, sort of produced a bunch of stuff before that that was you know equally as good what I really think that why I think that her um shorter poems land right is that the, what, what these guys have already been saying but also like there's like a, a weird kind of precise logic that is also kind of wonky can I just read this that I, what she read today right I, I just want to give one example because I did some homework um, well, firstly, there's two things. The first one is sometimes just the placement of one object or word can do something wonderful. And it often takes place at the end of the poem, right? So in the um, the first poem that she read tonight, the uh, my mum with a pair of scissors, like mm-hmm. it's like musing on where, where my mum's been, has she been doing that? And then she has this long bit about like, um, you know, being followed around, mosquitoes, etc. And then at the end, she says, is she frightened? I have no idea. Maybe she just sleeps all day, like pears. And it's the pears, you're just like, hold on, it's like almost like pears kind of win the whole poem over in some mm. ways, don't they? Or so change yeah. them. Yeah, um, in fact, in, in, in another poem, it's like jokes. I mean, she she makes these... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The end, yeah, right? I found the one that I liked, actually, which has a kind of particularly like, which has a... It's not exactly the same, but it's an also a little twist at the end. She says, after going nuts at the funeral, she bought herself a swimsuit and a lake. And it's like, most people go a lake and a swimsuit, but it's a swimsuit and a lake. It's just really funny, that little, tiny little twist. Uh, mm. She's very yeah. good. Can Somebody I just point else- out one more thing, just because I've desperately, desperately been thinking about Salima Hill all day and I'll cry if I don't get the opportunity to say <laughs> something <laughs> like um you know that poem that goes uh, her green and white striped dress that she she also is mm-hmm. yeah her green and white striped dress the same as mine the sort of dress you wear to ride a goat or murder someone on a dark night right those two bits opening bits like they have like these uh gestures towards like the absurd and then the sinister right and we have this kind of we kind of hold the sinister of this like all murder someone it's said quite flippantly but then like it kind of holds its space right and it holds its space all the way until the final two lines when something sinister actually happens so she she sticks in these two kind of decoy moments of the sinister like so as a placeholder to then turn the whole thing on its head which is something that i think which is weird to say like even critiquing salima hill right it's like um it's like the third best member of a boy band trying to talk about the beatles like i feel woefully unqualified to talk about it right but if i had to like i would say that that poem in itself is a it, it's gestures towards a, a slight step forward or a little subversion from what Salima Hill normally does, which is which is that a lot is kind of hinged on that last line, the like pairs moment, you know. And in the and in this poem, there are like three tiny turns, and that the last one kind of lands heavier because she's already because she's already sort of suggested that she's done the sinister bit. That murder someone. So you're like, all oh, right, well, that bit's happened. So where's it? Oh, no, the sinister bit comes in at the end. Do you know what I mean? That's so true. Yeah, yeah. That's so true. And it, yeah, you're right, aren't you? Because 
um, you, you kind of set off on a Salim Hill poem and you you know that you're in for a surprise, you know something's going to happen, you've no idea what it is. But that 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 poem that you've 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 picked up on is is kind of there's a setup, isn't there? That is uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But she also she just draws you in. Like you know, I don't know how much um input, Neil, you have in the ordering, I'm sure. Um I'm sure you do, but the, the, that very opening line again that Wayne was talking about, and the, the and my mum, my mother with a pair of scissors. Why is my mother never seen at school? I mean, how how could you not? How could you not read on? Um, <laughs> you want to know? Yeah, you know, how old is the mother? Why is she? What what is going on? You've got to read on, and uh, she's just uh, she's very good at, um, at hooking you in. Um, Can I ask one last question of everyone re regarding Salima Hill? Then, Mark, I'm sure we'll come back to you. Yeah. Like, I love to, you know, stroke your hair a bit more metaphorically, <laughs> tell you how great you are. But, like, what do you not think of the use of parentheses in some of these poems that Salim has been writing then? Like, um, like, there's a playfulness to it. But, again, like, this is what you were talking about just there, Julia. Like, uh, my mother on the verge of tears. The last stanza is all parenthesized. Like yeah. actually, she doesn't call it a tea towel. She calls it a drying up cloth, which is longer, which is longer and doesn't sound so cosy. Yeah. But she's and like that. Yeah. She doesn't like things to be cosy. Like for a minute, the rest of the poem, you know, it's, you know, even in that last stanza, you've got like the parentheses bit. It's like, oh, she doesn't call it this. She calls it a drying up cloth. And immediately that draws you, you feel closer to the mum. Right. And then she says, but but it's less cozy and she doesn't like things to be cozy. She kind of draws you into the mum and then pushes you away from. It. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah, and exactly. Really I know exactly what you mean. And it feels like the whole point is that her mum is not cozy and that that's the point And she's withheld it. You mm. would make me think as well. There's a, a poem that she read tonight, The Shimmering Plains of Africa, which I just found really touching, which was one of the ones about when she was at school or when her char the character, Salima, was at school, about her matron. And it's uh, and again, and it's exactly what you were just saying, uh, Wayne. So the second half is like just this one long sentence. Well, it's not exactly what you were saying, but you'll see what I mean. So... And then she says, matron in her gore skirt and cardigan, who combs her hair, who causes her giraffes, who does this, whose hair is like the shimmering plains of Africa, who blah, 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 blah. All these sort of bits in parenthesis. Then finally, is capable of nothing except, you know, something we later understand as love. And uh, um. I, I don't know what to say about that apart from that she is very she's very she's very skillful at doing it and it, it, it gives me the feeling of I've got to hold my breath uh through and I'm willing to do that because I know that the payoff will be worth it you know um and in later Salima Hill you won't have to hold your breath for too long because the poem yeah. doesn't often go on that long which yeah. is lucky isn't it if you're having to hold your breath like, that's a really I really do what you said there Julia I think that's like another bit of insight that gives me something to think about afterwards like um yeah. and there's, there's also this other thing about places of safety in the poems like the gravel pits you think of as somewhere unsafe but mm. you soon learn reading the poems that the only time she feels safe is when she's swimming yeah um, she feels safe in water whereas she feels unsafe and alienated in in the world of school and 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 in, in at home and and in other social circumstances yeah and her uh, mother hates swimming doesn't she yeah but, but she loves swimming so remember, swimming is where she feels safe mm -hmm. i want to ask mark and wayne i want to ask everybody um somebody asked me today because to, I was saying you've got to read some of these poems, both Mark, both Marks and Salima's. And he, he said to me, that is Salima, he was laughing out loud at some of these poems and, and saying, you know, does she intend to be humorous? And I said, do you know? I don't know, because because sometimes there's that mix between real humor and kind of heartbreaking uh, tragedy almost. and um, 
I don't know. She was smiling a lot in her reading, but I've I never dared. In the film, you actually see that that, that swing yeah. from one to the other all the time. It's just what happens in the poems. Yeah. She so she always that, I think, in the film. Yeah, she did. Yeah. yeah. I absolutely feel she knows when she's being funny. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. She must. I think that's that humor, like the humor does something very specific in a lot of Salima Hill's poems, right? In that it subsidizes the, or a lot of the, like, that like you would describe in the like, heartbreak is subsidized by the humor, right? And that, I reckon that works for two reasons. Firstly, the, um, the heartbreaking moments land more because they come as a, in a juxtaposition to the, um, to the humor. But also, and that might sound obvious, the, the other thing I think is, is there's, there's a slight empathy for the reader something that I think is really important, right? In that without the humour, if it was solidly just heartbreak the whole time, they'd be very difficult to, to read, especially um, at the volume that Selina Hill produces work at, right? Like, you, you'd have to stop. I wouldn't be able yeah. to hack it. So you have to have these moments that are punctuated by humour. Otherwise, like, they would be, they, they, it would feel too kind of, yeah, too much. Yeah. yeah. And so and that's a very kind of unique sense of awareness. That for, for me, it feels like Salima, it's it's kind of second nature to her now. So when you're sort of saying, does she know when she's being funny or whatever? I actually definitely does, but it almost probably happens almost automatically now. Because she knows, I think she's just got the nuts and bolts of her poems, like the mechanisms of her poems down so well. And mm. sometimes I reckon she puts those live... I've never actually met Salima, so I've spoken to her a few times, never met her. My entire assumption <laughs> is, that, is that she she knows her poems so well that sometimes those, she's probably put a line of humour in maybe even before she's realised she's done it. Do you know what I mean? I feel like she knows how to write these things and that must just be a great place to sort of land, especially, you know, um, after you've been writing for a very long time. Well, she also writes all the time, every day. Um, she had masses and masses of notebooks so they're now the old ones are now in the archive at Newcastle University so she she, yeah. is, she just keeps writing but yeah. at the same time she hates everything she's written which is which yes is it's the worm spaghetti thing yeah I once wrote to her sent her a card and said thank you uh, I really liked your poem in Poetry London about napkins and she said oh no I don't think I've written a poem about napkins <laughs> She didn't remember it at all. Yeah. Um, it's extraordinary to me. Yeah. 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 So now should we do a mark fest now? Let's do a little mark fest. So do you want to go first, Julia? Because it feels like he probably respects. I'm fine. Have you given me way as much as I need to last for Well, I just find I actually don't. I, okay, so the first time I came across your work was when, uh, again, it was Roddy Lumsden um, was saying, I've got to read, he was telling me I have to read you when um, around the time of, I think it was around the time of Identity Parade. Uh, so I got, so Meanwhile Trees, that was, when was that? It was 2016, wasn't it? Meanwhile, trees is packed away somewhere. Um, but yeah, let me just tell you that I have got rid of a lot of poetry books recently. I know this is a terrible thing to do, but I just had so many and I was moving. And this was before Neil asked me to do this uh, event. And uh, yours are still in the boxes. Hey, <laughs> so um, I, I like your work very much. And I don't, I don't know. I, I've, I'm interested in this, um, what, what people have been saying about John Ashbury, um, Wallace Stevens. I don't know. you Because I know you are, are you born in America? Were you born in America? Yeah. I was. Yeah. And so influence wise, I hate people asking about influences. Do you feel you have influences and when people say oh yes this reminds me a little bit of uh you know Stevens or whatever how do you feel about that well I don't I have a theory that um you know how the bands that you like are the bands that 
you heard when you were between the ages of like 13 and 20, I think. Yeah. So like, I think the Smiths happened when I was about 24. And people who were a little bit younger than me just went completely, became absolutely besotted. Mm. I was just a tiny bit too old for it really to go in properly. And I feel like that about writing, that um, even though I wasn't exposed to very much, it's the things that you, you'd you shown at school or that you discover around that kind of age. Or you, I didn't go to university, but I'm guessing if people did, the, the stuff they come into contact then is the stuff yeah. that really goes in and that you might like, you know, you might come across people you love later, but I don't think they'll get under your skin and affect the way you produce things. Yeah. If you don't, find, yeah, if it happens later. What do you reckon then? Because <clears throat> I reckon in your work, there's there's a kind of, linguistically it, well it's, it's kind of like there's a there's almost like a latent sort of language that we receive from our childhood right like I mean maybe just like culturally you know uh for me anyway but a lot of the time you know you use language you sometimes like stick in almost an arbitrary sound or two right but it makes it it kind of adds texture and it and it and it's like integral to the poem often but when you're reading it, you think, what even is this? And there's often, it of, like, there's often, a, uh, I was, so, you sit there and you think, where do I recognise? Where do I recognise this voice? Or where do I recognise this language? And often it feels like, it's like a, the creeping recognition is that is the kind of voiceover or the speaker of, like, some show that you watched when you were a kid. And, like... And, I, and and the way that you're able to sort of take that and then move it into like a, a, a very different, a very different kind of context, I think is one of the reasons the works, the work pretty much succeeds. But like, it's also one of those things where you have to watch out because you could become like a self parody, isn't it? Yeah. How do you guard against that? And all, but also, other people can could rip you off, but then they, but then everyone would be like, "Oh, this is like a Mark Waldron B side." <laughs> yeah. I think it's just a very good thing that you've managed to to sort of land, and then, uh, if, and then just ensuring that you're kind of moving forward with it, you know, instead of just because you could turn out the same trick again and again now, couldn't you? Like, and it would always be quite fun, um, and a relief, you know. Yeah, uh, well, but, I guess everybody has that issue, don't they? Um, it is it is hard to um to kind of because you don't even see yourself doing it. Yeah, a lot of, I'm sure for all of us that there are I'm sure there are tricks Salima has that she doesn't know she's got them. I always start to feel really uncomfortable when I, when it comes up as a subject because I kind of don't want to see what they are. Yeah. Um, you know, because maybe they won't work once I know what they are, kind of thing. But definitely. And you, to some extent, you have to rely on people that you show your work to to tell you um, that sounds like a yeah, parody but, of yourself, kind of. Um, thing. That's another thing. That happened. Um, also, that Baroque element to me mm. connects with something like 1940s black and white British films. Often, the, the the way people speak in those films, that kind of arch way that. That, that seems so unreal now you you sort of pick up on a lot of those registers in your poems yeah I do love picking up on I mean some of the poems I did today the one about contingency I thought I'm going to start throwing poshness into my poem yeah, I'm conscious that I've got kind of a middle class accent and I thought oh Mark you know stop kind of resisting that or, <laughs> I mean not that I do really but but, um, you know, start putting sort of posh sounds in your poems, like a broom, broom and a char, char. It's like, <laughs> I want them to take the piss. No, no one's going to know that who sees the poem. But I'm sort of slightly taking the piss out of how I might be seen in some way. That, and that, I mean, I, I suppose Ashbury does do, he doesn't do that, but he certainly likes to find 
hackneyed phrases and um, uh. Uh, and use them as titles or just suddenly drop some terrible cliche. Uh, he's absolutely brilliant at that. But you, yeah, there are things you do more self consciously in that in that vein, like um, in your, you know, the first half you read the sort of fairy tale inspired um, poems, and um, in the uh, you see, there's a line here I'm just looking at. Is that you befrolicking off in the Bitown Square? <laughs> <laughs> It's just, uh, I, I, you know, that sort of word playfulness makes me makes me laugh, which is always a good thing, of course. Um, and uh, can I can I ask a burning question that I will kick myself if I forget to ask? And it's about it's about the word surrealism, because I think I might be wrong, but I think both you and Salima have been described as surreal. And 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 I I think she hates it. She said that she hates that. She hates the kind of wacky, arbitrary nature of um, what people tend to mean when they use that word surreal. And that she feels she's doing the opposite. That she she thinks she's um, kind of straightening reality or un- unfolding it in her own unique Salima Hill way. Um, and uh, I've, I've, I've found that very interesting that she is so averse to uh, being described in that way. And I, I really want to know how you feel about the word surreal, because it's not necessarily an insult at all, but, uh, you know, do you find people calling you it and, and how do you feel about it? Yeah, I mean, I have certainly found that. Um, I think I wrote a little piece for someone in which I was talking about how surely the surreal is a much, the world is better described through surreal images than it is through any kind of realism, because the world actually is quite surreal. But the first time I, someone said to me, oh, I want you to come and do a talk about surrealism because your work's so surreal. I thought, what, what's he talking about? I mean, this is a while back. Mm. But I did some research and I read one thing by by Henri Michaud, who said he called it la grande permission, and that it was like this thing happened. I mean, obviously, Lewis Carroll and people like that were playing around with stuff before, but but when in the thirties, when or twenties, thirties, when when it took off, that that it was a kind of a permission was given that we're all still. Benefit. It's a bit like you can't really. It's affected all of us, hasn't it? That we're uh, in the same way that postmodernism has. You can't really not. Your writing can't not be affected by that. But I also understand Salima's thing that um. I think one of my characters in in one of my books talks about the promiscuous availability of unlikely juxtaposition. And he's talking about how surrealism's just become too easy because that's the that's the kind of space we're living in now, kind of. If you know what I yeah, mean. but you almost sorry. No, wait. You go, no, you go, you go. Well, I, thought, I just try. I'll stick to one sentence. But you're almost sort of saying, um, Mark, the same kind of thing as Salima because I don't think she sees. I mean, maybe this is to do with her Aspergers, but she. I don't think she sees her images as being weird or surreal um and 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 you were sort you were saying something similar you you didn't understand why this person had asked you to talk about surrealism and that the world is is weird the world is weird you know every you know so what 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 even is surrealism in a way anyway that was a very simple point but so wayne yeah sorry quick observation about that right is mark's poem about swapping clothes with a friend that's not surreal, right? Mm. It just seems surreal because it's an it's an odd thing to observe and sort of like spend spend enough time on. So like you could that that could be like one line in the poem, right? Swapping clothes with a friend. People probably have used that as one line. But the fact that that's the whole poem, 
That's the point that Mark is investigating. Mm. That's why it seems surreal. Mm. I often think when people say surreal, it's the same as when they say stream of consciousness. It's just lazy, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a shorthand for I don't really understand what's going on here. Like, so I'm going to use a phrase. And I think that I think that with Salima, like what makes her work interesting is that it that those moments that people would call surreal are actually just her step using an object or using something to step outside for a moment just to step outside the literal so that otherwise the poems would just be these linear descriptions of stuff but everything that we've noted about her work already is her kind of elevating or lifting her poems away from that that kind of like just that that kind of literal interpretation right so when you when you describe something like pears or you stick like a line in saying like, you know, this is a sort of dress you'd ride a goat on. Like, I mean, it's not that you, I would, I, I don't know what sort of dress people would or wouldn't ride a goat on, but like, it's the, the fact that she uses that phrase is the thing that makes you see the dress in a, in a different yeah. light, isn't it? Yeah. And I think that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think that's brilliantly put. I think what you said, particularly about stepping outside, um, is 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 what she's trying to do. I mean, you know, ask someone to describe shame, you know, an abstract concept, and uh, she describes it as like a white balloon rolling its cry from room to dusty room in, in search of flight. I think I think it's something like that anyway, but. Right. And is that totally, it's forcing you to step outside as well, isn't it? Well, from the little. You know what about that, Julia? Like, there's yeah. such a great example of that, of like, you know, like, I, I always talk about this, so it's probably really boring if I've got any students watching, right? But you know, uh, Kenneth Cope talks about, and he nicked this from someone else, but he talks about poetry being a, a, a second language or a language within a language, right? And like, if you take that line, and you just put it in everyday language, you know, that was just conversationally, you were sort of saying mm -hmm. that. It wouldn't really make any sense. But within the within the kind of framework of, like, poetry, that makes absolute sense. Like, it makes complete sense. So I, so and I don't know anything about, like, uh, Salima's Asperger's or anything like that. I just know that, like, she's fully entitled to, to question it when people are like, this is surreal, because actually... She's so deeply embedded in the language of poetry that it must seem obvious to her. You know, a white mm -hmm. balloon rolling and crying from room to room or whatever you said. It's like, it's an incredible image that literally does describe shame. Mm -hmm. You know? Exactly. But the thing that's so special about it is it's, um, it's, it's, it has its distance. Like, so the, the object that's being used to describe the abstract is the perfect distance away from the abstract, isn't it? So like, if it was any closer, like it would, it wouldn't work as a simile or whatever. But because it, because of that distance, like it, it works really well, and it almost has that bi-directional quality, doesn't it? Of like, hold on, is the balloon describing shame here, or is shame describing the balloon? We can look kind of both ways, which is something I think really helps. Like, see, I mean, I didn't come up with this, but like, um, it, it's a, it's something that I that I've kind of really taken on board when I'm thinking about like simile or metaphor like that. that's interesting. interesting yeah yeah really yeah, interesting. yeah. Well, this, this has been a great discussion but I think we need need to let our audience uh, go off and get their dinners now um, so I'd like to thank Mark Waldron Wayne Holloway Smith and Julia Copus and also thank Salima for um, being filmed for this event um, do go to the Blood Axe website and order their books. And if you go to Salima's page on the Buttocks website and go to Women in Comfortable Shoes, you can see their links to the, the full film that we've shown tonight, as well as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, another film of her reading from her other books that she's published since Gloria. So thank you everyone for watching and uh, I hope you'll enjoy reading the books.